It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sean Scared to speak at Medicine Grand Rounds this morning. Dr. Scared is a professor in the Department of Medicine and Section Chief at Harborview Medical Center for the Division of Pulmonary, Critical Care, and Sleep Medicine. He attends in the Harborview Chest Clinic, on the Harborview Medicine or Pulmonary Medicine Consult Service, and on the Harborview Intensive Care Units, both medical and surgical. Dr. Scared obtained his medical degree from New York University and then completed his house staff training at Yale. He then completed two separate fellowships, both in infectious disease and pulmonary and critical care medicine here at the University of Washington. During his time on faculty here, Dr. Scared has excelled in clinical care, basic science research, and education of fellows, house staff, and medical students. He is distinguished as a fellow of both the American College of Physicians and the American College of Chest Physicians. He has also been consistently honored in physician survey-based lists of America's top doctors. Dr. Scared's research focuses on understanding the cellular and molecular basis of pulmonary host defense against infection, specifically the innate immune response to bacterial pathogens. His lab studies the interactions between alveolar macrophages, the airway epithelium, and specific organisms, including Legionella pneumophila. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Scared as he presents Legionnaire's disease. Thank you, Ryan, for the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite subjects. So in the Grand Rounds tradition, let's begin with a case from the University of Washington Medical Center. This is a 46-year-old man who's 10 days status post-orthotopic heart transplant, and he's having an un unexceptional recovery. He's having a little incisional pain, denies any shortness of breath or cough. He's on the usual medications, mycophenolate, prednisone, and tacrolimus. Uh, the usual prophylactics, trimethoprim sulfa and gancyclovir. Uh, he has a low-grade fever, uh, uh, 37.8, but his exam is otherwise unremarkable. Laboratory tests show a white count of 24,000, which is up substantially, uh, with a, a left shift in lymphopenia. His serum sodium is 125, and his other lab tests are otherwise unremarkable. Because of the leukocytosis, he has a chest X-ray, uh, which demonstrates an uh, ill-defined opacity in the right lateral lung field. Because of this, a CT scan is done, which shows a, a focal nodular opacity in the right lower lobe with some surrounding ground glass opacity. Now, the workup uh, in, uh, for a patient like this who's immunosuppressed, and there's a lot of concern, uh, he has blood cultures which are negative, Serum cryptoantigen and galactomannan are also negative. A urinary antigen test for Legionella pneumophila is positive. However, the patient received ATG, which can result in false positives on that test. And so uh, uh, an induced sputum was ordered for Legionella culture, which was negative. He had already been started on antibiotics at that point. Uh, and, it, and it was also sent for PCR, PCR which was positive for Legionella pneumophila, uh, confirming active infection. He was treated with levofloxacin for 21 days, and uh, his, the outcome was an uneventful recovery with documented radiographic uh, clearance. Now, there are several things about this case that are typical of Legionnaire's disease. It was uh, nosocomially acquired. It was an uh, opportunistic infection in a transplant patient. Um, that He had a focal nodular opacity, which is a very typical finding in legionellosis. Um, and uh, he had a, a hyponatremia, which is often seen. There are some atypical features in that he had virtually no symptoms of this, uh, which is unusual. He had a very low-grade temperature, also unusual. And we will come back to some of those uh, uh, in a moment. So the things that uh, you should know about legionellosis, uh, just to summarize at the beginning here, are that uh, uh, these infections are caused by aquatic gram-negative rods of the genus Legionella. There are more than 60 species. They're widely distributed in fresh water, and about half of these organisms have been associated with human disease. These are intracellular pathogens, and their natural host is free-living amoebae. Humans are accidental hosts. The infection is acquired by inhalation of aerosols generated by uh, man-made disseminators uh, in virtually every case. And there are two clinical syndromes, Legionnaire's disease, which is pneumonia, which is what I'm going to focus on, and Pontiac fever, which is a non-pneumonic flu-like illness uh, with a uh, very high attack rate uh, that I won't say very much about. The uh, infection can either be sporadic or uh, epidemic uh, and is often opportunistic. The diagnosis can be made uh, best by culture, uh, uh, urinary antigen detection, and PCR. 
treatment is with either a fluoroquinolone or azithromycin. So let's go into some of the details. And first, let's go back to the beginning. 1976, the bicentennial celebration. Uh, there were parades, speeches, reenactments, all sorts of things going on. It was also an election year. Uh, and while uh, Jerry Ford was uh, patching things up with the Queen, uh, Jimmy Carter was kissing babies. In the midst of all this celebration, there was a remarkable outbreak in Philadelphia. The American Legion Department of Pennsylvania held their 58th annual convention at the Bellevue Stratford Hotel, the Grand Dam of Philadelphia uh, Hotels, uh, from July 21 to July 24. Uh, and shortly, or within a week or so of the uh, end of the convention, uh, there had been 182 cases of pneumonia uh, among the more than 4,000 uh, conventioneers, uh, uh, characterized by high fever, headache, cough, myalgias, and there were 29 deaths. There were also 39 cases of Broad Street pneumonia, uh, and five of those died. And this is defined, uh, was defined as people that were never, uh, never entered this hotel, uh, but we're within a block of the hotel, uh, which was located on the corner of Market and Broad Streets. The name Broad Street Pneumonia was a bit of an inside joke among the EIS officers uh, because it referred not only to the location of the hotel, but to a famous investigation of an 1854 outbreak of cholera in London investigated by uh, uh, Dr. John Snow, who uh, traced the epidemic uh, to a specific water pump on Broad Street uh, and ended the epidemic when he took the handle off the uh, uh, Broad Street water pump. Now, the CDC was notified of this outbreak on August 2nd, Monday morning, uh, by a physician at the uh, VA hospital in Philadelphia uh, who was seeing a bunch of these patients um, and thought there was something going on. The investigation fell to Dr. David Frazier, who was the head of the Special Pathogens Branch, and the CDC launched what was, at that point, the largest investigation they had ever undertaken. They, they dispatched more than 30 field officers and assigned more than 70 uh, laboratory workers to process specimens. They quickly, uh, in this uh, uh, photograph here, is uh, a picture of, uh, of Stephen Thacker, uh, in, uh, one of the EIS officers who eventually became chief of the EIS service, uh, interviewing a, uh, a uh, uh, legionnaire at um, a hospital in Pennsylvania. They quickly identified that uh, uh, age, uh, of course male gender, it was a legionnaire's convention, age, smoking, COPD were risk factors. Um, the pattern uh, of, of disease suggested airborne exposure. Uh, and they noticed that there were no secondary cases. Uh, and this is an important observation that this was not a contagious disease. Um, all of the microbiological and toxin studies that they did uh, at the outset were negative. So the question was, what was the cause? This was a big deal at the time. Uh, I was in medical school and I remember the daily headlines uh, that, that were really uh, went on for, for months. There was a, a great deal of uh, uh, fear bordering on hysteria that was precipitated by this uh, epidemic that had uh, uh, affected so many people and uh, been so highly lethal, and yet the cause was not identified. Uh, there was a lot of speculation. Uh, initially, the thought was this might be swine flu, about which there was a lot of speculation at the time. That was quickly ruled out, but, uh, but the, the fear of swine, swine, swine flu persisted and, in fact, contributed to the uh, undertaking of a disastrous swine flu uh, vaccination campaign later that fall. Um, uh, there, were also, there was also concern about uh, some sort of poison, uh, a terrorist attack. There was a lot of uh, uh, a worry about um, different uh, potentialities here. Uh, and of course, there was also a little bit of fake news, uh, even back in 1976. Now, as things went on without uh, the CDC uh, finding what the cause it was here, is that uh, now we began to have investigations of the investigation. And in fact, in November of 1976, the uh, uh, officers of the CDC were called on the carpet uh, of the Senate uh, for hearings as to why they couldn't figure out what was going on here. Uh, this is David Frazier, the head of the Special Pathogens Branch, um, being uh, grilled by the senators. Meanwhile, um, the, um, 
uh, work at the CDC continued, and finally there was a breakthrough in early 1977. At this point, uh, the important work was being done by Joseph McDade, uh, shown here with his supervisor, Charles Shepard. McDade was a rickettsiologist, and he had taken some lung tissue from the Legionnaires and injected guinea pigs uh, in, in an effort to isolate Coxiella burnettii, the cause of Q fever. Um, the guinea pigs all died, and, uh, but he didn't find any evidence of Coxiella or any rickettsiae. Um, he did, however, see bacilli uh, in the spleens uh, of the guinea pigs, and in fact, this is one of his original images uh, with this Humana stain showing these organisms, um, and found that uh, the guinea pig uh, uh, spleens of subcultured could, um, in embryonated uh, uh, yolk sacs of embryonated hen's eggs, uh, could also grow this organism, but it was initially, initially dismissed as a contaminant because they weren't looking for bacteria, a conventional bacteria. The concept that an uh, unknown bacteria could cause an epidemic human disease like this seemed preposterous in 1976. No new bacterial pathogens have been identified in decades. And so the idea that there was something out there causing disease was really unheard of. Um, and this was, in fact, the original emerging infectious disease. So that uh, he went back to this after, uh, in fact, after particularly getting uh, uh, insulted at a cocktail party around the holidays uh, uh, about the CDC's failure, and in fact went back to the lab uh, and began to work on this particular organism, uh, and eventually was able to grow this bug on some uh, specialized media. Uh, he then obtained serum from the Legionnaires and demonstrated that it reacted with this organism by indirect fluorescence. Um, and then uh, uh, was able to isolate this same bug from two of six uh, Legionnaires' uh, lungs. So the pathogen had been identified. Eventually, this was known as the Legionnaires' disease bacillus for a number of years and was eventually named Legionella pneumophila uh, in 1979. And it was subsequently found to be the cause of numerous prior epidemics, including Pontiac fever, uh, which was an outbreak of 144 cases of non-mnemonic illness that affected 95% of the people that worked in a public health building in Pontiac, Michigan. Uh, none of them had pneumonia, but they had a flu-like illness. Uh, it also was the cause of an outbreak of pneumonia at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C., 81 cases of pneumonia uh, in 1965, another outbreak at an Austin, Minnesota meatpacking plant with 78 cases of pneumonia in 1957. And then they went back to the freezers and identified this organism as the cause of sporadic cases of pneumonia dating back to 1943. Shortly thereafter, other species began to be identified. Legionella mcdadii was uh, identified as the so-called Pittsburgh pneumonia agent, which had been reported in 1976 and 1977 as the cause of outbreaks of pneumonia among uh, transplant recipients in Pennsylvania and Virginia. And then other pathogenic species were subsequently identified. And not long after this, we began to see, of course, many other emerging pathogens. Um, uh, Lyme disease, HIV, uh, Campylobacter, uh, Helicobacter, other organisms that had previously not been, un been uh, diagnosed. But this was really the first new pathogen that had appeared uh, as a significant cause of human disease in decades. So the family Legionellaceae now includes one genus, uh, more than 60 species, uh, and more than 75 serotypes. Half of these have been associated with human disease. Uh, there are, they are fastidious gram-negative bacilli. The closest relative is, in fact, Coxiella uh, burnettii, the cause of Q fever. And all of these organisms are facultative intracellular parasites. They're found widespread in fresh water and moist soil around the world. They prefer warm water. They grow well in the range of 20 to 50 degrees Celsius. Uh, they can survive at other uh, extremes. And their natural host is free-living amoebae. More than 15 species of amoebae and ciliated protozoa will support the intracellular replication of Legionella, such as this uh, Hartmanella vermiformis, which is packed full of uh, Legionella pneumophila. Now, transmission to humans occurs in three steps. First, you have a reservoir, fresh water, moist soil, where the organism is living. Then you have to have some sort of amplifier and that includes water storage tanks, hot water plumbing systems, particularly in old buildings that have been repeatedly remodeled, and you have corroded pipes, you have dead legs of uh, plumbing that become coated with biofilms and places where organisms can uh, collect. Uh, thermal effluent, thermal spring, springs, and even compost can be uh, amplification sites. Then finally, you need a disseminator, something that generates an infectious aerosol from these uh, amplifiers. Uh, the most common culprit is cooling towers, 
uh, which by their structure, they emit a warm mist from the uh, top of the tower uh, as the water is cooled. Air conditioning systems, evaporative condensers, these are all heat exchange units that produce uh, uh, vapors and aerosols of warm water. Industrial coolants, shower heads, whirlpool spas, nebulizers and other respiratory therapy equipment, produce sprayers in the supermarket, uh, excavation sites. You just have to hold your breath. <laughs> So many of you may remember what happened at Mount St. Helens on May 18th and 1980. This was uh, the mountain on May 17th. Uh, this is a mountain at 8.30 in the morning on May 18th, and this is what it looked like afterwards. Now, what does this have to do with Legionnaire's disease? Well, it has to do with the biology of Spirit Lake, which is the lake right at the base of the mountain, on the north side of the mountain, right in the pathway of the blast uh, and the uh, lava flow. This is a picture of the Army Corps of Engineers hut right at, uh, the, uh, at Spirit Lake. This uh, site was closed for years after the uh, eruption uh, while the Army Corps of Engineers uh, dredged out all the water drainage uh, and reestablished uh, drainage and cleaned up the area. But it was also a great opportunity for field biologists to study the repopulation of the blast zone, which had obviously undergone some dramatic transformation. And one of the things that was discovered um, is that uh, the biology of Spirit Lake changed quite a bit. As you might imagine, with lava flowing into it, the temperature went up. Uh, and it was measured at 34 degrees centigrade on May 20th. Bacterial counts in the water then were very high, 10 to the 6th to 10 to the 7th uh, CFU per mil. There were many species of algae and protozoa, and there was high mineral content, including uh, iron. Turns out these conditions are really ideal for growing Legionella. Uh, and in April 1981, uh, the Washington State biologists uh, uh, noted that there were several re reports of uh, a number of cases of febrile respiratory illness among visitors to the blast zone. These were Army Corps of Engineers personnel, uh, scientists that were uh, visiting the area, uh, and there, the, the cause of this was not identified. Now, they found six species of Legionella in the water, including two new species, St. Helensi and Spiritensis, and frankly, some other species that they never bothered to work up uh, uh, further. But there was concern raised about whether this might be a health hazard. Now, once the Army Corps of Engineers was finished, they were going to open up this area to tourism. So you have to uh, envision uh, uh, men in their uh, 50s and 60s and 70s, smokers with a little COPD, pulling up their RVs to the Mount St. Helens area and inhaling the fresh mountain air. So the question is, would that be uh, potentially dangerous? So uh, we tried to find out. Uh, this was a project that uh, was initiated by uh, Rich Loxley, who was a newly minted assistant professor at the VA at the time. Uh, he's been at uh, UCSF now for a number of years, uh, doing rather well for himself. Um, but he and the State Biology Laboratory pitched the idea to the Army Corps of Engineers that we should investigate this. And uh, they said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And I got to tag along. I was just beginning, beginning uh, uh, my research fellowship at the time, and I was uh, interested in this disease. So uh, the Army Corps of Engineers flew us in there uh, by helicopter. Uh, and uh, we brought along uh, 12 guinea pigs uh, in cages. And we distributed these guinea pigs uh, at different uh, sites near uh, waterways with uh, visible mist um, in the blast zone and then in some control areas outside of the blast zone. Uh, we put them down in the morning. We got the helicopter pilot to fly us down to the uh, uh, Palace River to do some steelhead fishing and then to pick us up and bring us back at the end of the day so we could pick up the guinea pigs. We then took them back to the laboratory uh, uh, to study them. So, I mean, here's, here's Rich uh, collecting a water sample. Uh, here's one of our guinea pig cages. Uh, and there's yours truly with another uh, pa uh, guinea pig cage. Um, uh, we took them back to the lab, and then I studied these uh, animals uh, for evidence of humoral and cellular immunity, ad, ad, observed them for signs of illness, and we found no illness, uh, and we found no evidence of an immune response. And so we concluded there did not appear to be a major hazard because guinea pigs are exquisitely sensitive to this infection. And this observation fits with what's been uh, noted over the, the, the last uh, uh, 40 years, and that's that despite the prevalence of this organism in the natural environment, uh, almost no cases of disease are associated with exposure to natural uh, uh, sites. 
that virtually every case is a result of inhalation of aerosols that are generated by a man-made device. So the risk factors for Legionnaires' disease are summarized here. Host factors have been well described. They were really evident from the very early outbreaks. Male gender, cigarette smoking, chronic lung, heart, kidney disease, diabetes, uh, hematologic malignancy, transplantation is a big risk, and immunosuppression. Corticosteroids increase the risk by two to six fold, and TNF antagonists have, uh, have emerged as another uh, risk factor uh, for this disease. And then uh, in addition to a susceptible host, you have to have an exposure history. Travel is often observed uh, uh, because of the association with hotels and cruise ships. Uh, exposure to whirlpool spas, uh, having uh, new plumbing work done in a, uh, your home or building where you work, disruptions in water supply, being near a decorative fountain, proximity to a cooling tower. Uh, and uh, a particular, particularly in the southern hemisphere, uh, working with potting soil, uh, which has been associated with uh, Legionella Long Beachy infection, which is the cause of 30% of Legionnaires' disease cases in New Zealand and Australia. The clinical features of Legionnaires' disease are, are well known. Uh, high fever, non-productive cough, chest pain, shortness of breath are typical. Headache, lethargy, uh, and diarrhea are common. Uh, a pulse tef temperature dissociation may be present. Uh, a, a temperature of 39 degrees and a heart rate of less than 100, for example, common to intracellular pathogens. Um, chest radiography may, uh, will typically show focal consolidation, which is often nodular, with some uh, associated ground glass opacity on CT. This often progresses to multi-lobar consolidation, as seen in this uh, uh, case. Uh, cavitation can occur uh, as well, but that's only been described in immunocompromised patients, or almost only. Uh, and small pleural fusions uh, are common, but large ones are unusual. Laboratory tests, uh, routine tests may show hyponatremia, hypophosphatemia, and elevated liver function tests, but there's nothing about the clinical presentation of Legionnaires' disease that's specific. Uh, you may be suspicious about it by this constellation of, of signs and symptoms, but it can't be distinguished on clinical grounds from other causes of community-acquired or hospital-acquired pneumonia. Extrapulmonary manifestations uh, are also well known. Uh, neurological uh, sequelae include encephalopathy, which can be quite severe. Uh, ataxia is relatively uh, uncommon, and uh, transverse myelitis is rare. Acute renal failure is a common complication. There are multiple etiologies of that, one of which is rhabdomyolysis, which is well described. Pancreatitis also can occur. And cardiac manifestations, such as endocarditis and myocarditis, are rare. So the diagnostic tests for Legionnaires' disease have undergone some evolution over time. Sputum culture, or, or culture of uh, endotracheal aspirate or bronchoalveolar lavage fluid, um, has a widely varying sensitivity, which is probably related to the presence of antibiotics and how the organism is, uh, the samples collected, but has the advantage of 100% sensi uh, specificity. Um, all species of Legionella will grow on specialized media if you request the, uh, the specialized media be used. Um, and so there's no bias towards certain uh, species or serotypes. Um, and the presence of Legionella in a respiratory tract uh, specimen is diagnostic of infection. Legionella never colonizes the respiratory tract. Um, Urinary uh, antigen, the, the problem with uh, culture is that you have to ask for it. The organism will not grow on routine media that's used for respiratory samples. All the laboratories locally can culture for Legionella, but you have to ask for it. Urinary antigen has become the dominant test, um, and it's a good test, it's, uh, uh, but it has some limitations that you have to be aware of. Uh, mostly, uh, the issue is that this test is designed only to affect, to diagnose Legionella pneumophilus serogroup 1. Now, this is the most common cause of Legionnaire's disease, but it's not the only cause of Legionnaire's disease. Um, the other issues with the, uh, so that a positive test can be helpful, uh, but a negative test doesn't exclude Legionnaire's disease. Also, the urinary antigen test um, uh, can remain positive for months. Uh, it's been uh, reportedly positive for as long as 46 weeks, and in most cases stays positive for at least six, so that uh, if somebody's uh, has no past history of uh, disease that could be compatible with this, that's fine, but you have to keep in mind that it's not necessarily diagnostic of acute infection. Now, uh, sputum or other respiratory tract uh, direct fluorescent antibody testing has fallen out of favor because of the need for 
specialized reagents and a fairly high degree of expertise to interpret these um, and is available mainly as a, a send out. It's still most useful for examining lung tissue uh, where it seems to have um, its greatest utility. Serum antibody tests are really not very helpful because you need a fourfold change in order to diagnose infection, so that's not going to be evident for a month or so. Also, both the sputum DFA and the serum antibody tests have really only been standardized for Legionella pneumophila and not for the other species. Keep in mind, 60 species, so there's a lot of possibilities here. Now, PCR is assuming a, uh, a more prominent role and uh, has somewhat varying sensitivity, uh, which is related to the different methodologies that are used. Uh, here at the UW, a whole genome sequencing strategy is used, which is uh, completely unbiased and will detect all species of, uh, of Legionella. Again, so if you find a positive, uh, uh, then it's diagnostic of, of acute infection and can tell you what species is uh, involved. These tests are not uh, available everywhere, um, but uh, as I mentioned, all the laboratories locally can do cultures. The uh, urine or antigen test is available 24-7 at the UW Medical Center, um, the serum, and the PCR test is also available uh, at the UW. Now, Legionella is poorly seen on gram stain, um, and that was evident from early on. Uh, if you look at this gram stain over here, you can, if you look closely, you can see some small gram-negative rods uh, here, but they're pretty difficult to see. They're easier to see if you counter stain with uh, uh, carbol fuchsin or basic fuchsin rather than the usual safranin, but it's still difficult to see. They'll show up more prominently on a, on a fluorescent antibody stain uh, in uh, skilled hands and also easily seen on a Humana stain, and some laboratories will use this routinely, especially in evaluating BAL samples. Um, Legionella mcdadii is also acid fast. It's the only one of the uh, Legionella species that is acid fast, but if you have somebody with a, 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 a sample that has gram-negative rods that are also acid fast, there's really nothing else it could be besides Legionella mcdadii. So the indications for diagnostic testing for Legionnaire's disease are summarized here. Uh, you don't need to do this on everybody, but perhaps in somebody with community-acquired pneumonia who's failing treatment, uh, a severe case of community-acquired pneumonia where the incidence of Legionella is higher, an immunocompromised host, outbreak setting, of course, travel history within two weeks, other exposure risks such as those we defined earlier, or if the patient uh, is in or from a colonized healthcare facility. Treatment of uh, Legionnaire's disease is pretty straightforward. There are several options, and resistance is not a problem. Uh, a fluoroquinolone uh, for 5 to 21 days, uh, the uh, uh, azithromycin, uh, azithromycin, any fluoroquinolone uh, will work, although levofloxacin is uh, most commonly used. Azithromycin seems to be more effective than clarithromycin or erythromycin, and doxycycline is probably not as uh, good as the other two. The duration of therapy has never been determined by definitive uh, uh, evaluation, but it's conventional and probably wise to treat immunocompromised patients for three weeks. There is a potential relapse rate. Now, this is a pretty serious infection with an overall mortality that's uh, between 5 and 10 percent uh, and really closer to the 10 percent range in most uh, outbreak settings. But in immunocompromised patients, the mortality is more than twice that, um, uh, upwards of 20 percent in virtually every uh, report. So the inhalation of Legionella uh, results in replication in alveolar macrophages. This is an uh, image from the original Philadelphia outbreak, a dealer Lee silver stain, showing that the organism is uh, concentrated in mononuclear phagocytes in the lungs. This is a slide generated by Dave Park when he worked in my laboratory uh, uh, more than 20 years ago, demonstrating the replication, the really uh, 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 dense replication of this organism in human alveolar macrophages. Um, and Dave also showed that um, this organism replicated, this is a log scale here, really robustly in human alveolar macrophages and more robustly than in human monocytes uh, ob obtained from the same subject. So this organism is well adapted to alveolar macrophages. It just happens that human alveolar macrophages seem to resemble amoebae. Uh, and so the organism is quite happy there. Now, the basics of the uh, intracellular pathogenesis of this infection were, uh, to a great degree, worked out by Marcus Horwitz uh, in the 1980s when he was at Rockefeller. He's been at UCLA for a long time. He showed initially that there was uh, uh, an uh, unusual but not unique coiling phagocytosis method that resulted in the creation of a unique phagosome that initially uh, was surrounded by clusters of vesicles 
then attracted components of mitochondria, mitochondria, and then eventually became studded with ribosomes. The organism replicated within this vacuole to very high densities, and then eventually the um, uh, cell would rupture. The uh, mechanisms by which this organism is able to accomplish this feat is, uh, is uh, a result of its uh, DOT ICM type 4 secretion system. Now, DOT stands for defect in organelle trafficking, and ICM stands for intracellular mul multiplication. And these are two distinct loci that encode 27 proteins that make up this type 4 secretion system. This system spans the, uh, the vacuolar membrane and exports uh, more than 330 protein effectors into the cytoplasm of the host cell. This is the largest arsenal of any uh, bacterium, the largest arsenal of effectors of any bacterium by far. Uh, more than twice as many as any other known agent. Coxiella has about 150 with a very similar secretion system. Most of these effectors are unique to Legionella. Some are, in fact, of eukaryotic origin, meaning they stole these proteins from amoebae um, so that they could better manipulate the host uh, cellular machinery. Uh, many are functionally redundant, which is also very unusual among bacterial uh, effectors. And some are meta-effectors, meaning they don't directly target the host uh, uh, functions. They target the activities of other effectors, so they can modulate their own effectors during different stages of the uh, intracellular infection. This system serves to establish the replicative niche and to interfere with host defense. Now, these effectors include a variety of ubiquitinases and deubiquitinases, GTPases, phosphatidyl inositol phosphatases, um, and they serve to regulate or interfere with virtually every aspect of the cellular machinery. Uh, vesicle and endosome trafficking and prevents uh, fusion of the vacuole with lysosomes, which is a conventional way of killing intracellular pathogens. It modulates programmed cell death, initially inhibiting cell death. Um, and then stimulating it later, inhibiting it while the organism replicates, and then stimulating it when the organism wants to get out of the cell. Modulates gene expression, protein synthesis and turnover, signal transduction, autophagy, which is a mechanism by which the um, uh, cell gets rid of uh, cytoplasmic, uh, gets rid of or recycles cytoplasmic garbage, uh, is interfered with uh, by Legionella. It also can chelate micronutrients to facilitate its own metabolism and interfere with that of the host cell. Um, the sophistication of this system is thought to uh, result from the long history of coevolution of Legionella with a diverse variety of amoebic hosts uh, that has forced it to develop a, a, a multiplicity of strategies that just happens to work well in human alveolar macrophages. Now, I've been interested in the activation of innate, immune, uh, uh, innate immunity to this infection as well as others. And uh, one of the areas that we've looked at is the, uh, rec the, the pattern recognition receptors that are involved in detecting this organism and initiating defensive responses. Um, the, uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, toll-like receptors, which are membrane-bound uh, uh, pattern recognition receptors, uh, can recognize bacterial ligands. Uh, and then with their associated uh, co-receptors and uh, adapter molecules stimulate uh, signal transduction resulting in the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines and type 1 interferons. There also are, uh, can be toll-like receptors uh, within endosomes such as toll 9 and sometimes toll 2 and toll 4 which can similarly stimulate um, uh, host responses. And there are also cytosolic receptors like the large family of nod-like receptors uh, that can further amplify pro-inflammatory responses, but also stimulate the activation of caspase-1 uh, via the inflammasomes, which can result in uh, maturation of IL-1 beta and IL-18 and stimulation of a specific cell death pathway that I'll get back to in a moment. Now, we uh, showed some time ago that Legionella is recognized by TOL-2 and TOL-5. Um, this uh, on the left here uh, is a reporter assay in which we've uh, transfected naive cells with um, uh, toll-like receptors that are linked to a downstream uh, reporter uh, that, when activated, releases uh, is uh, uh, emits light because it's connected to the Lux gene. So we can detect uh, toll uh, ligand activation by the emission of light from the cell. Uh, IL-1 is used as a nonspecific stimulus. Um, uh, LPS is a control, PAM3 is a TOL2 ligand, uh, LPS is a TOL4 ligand, PAM3 a TOL2 ligand, and then Legionella here. And uh, Legionella will stimulate a response when TOL2 is present, 
that response is amplified in the presence of TOL1 and TOL6, which are co-receptors with TOL2, but it doesn't stimulate a response in the presence of TOL4. And we've also done this with purified Legionella, uh, Legionella LPS, which is, has an unusual structure, and in contrast to most other forms of LPS, doesn't stimulate TOL4, it stimulates TOL2. The organism also, uh, most species of Legionella are flagellated, um, and flagellin is the only known ligand for TOL5, and so this organism does stimulate TOL5. This is another uh, reporter assay using a different uh, cell population, and we see that um, uh, wild-type Legionella stimulates a response, uh, as does purified flagellin, but a uh, isogenic mutant of Legionella that lacks the flagellin uh, um, uh, gene does not stimulate a response. So TOL2 and TOL5. Tom Hahn, who I've collaborated with on a number of studies over the years, has identified TLR polymorphisms uh, and, and that are related to human susceptibility of Legionnaires' disease. Specifically, uh, he found that a uh, relatively common uh, TOL5 polymorphism that results in a non-functional TOL5 and the inability to recognize flagellin uh, is associated with a, uh, a increased risk, a roughly uh, two-fold increased risk of of Legionnaires' disease. This data was derived from a uh, uh, subject, a case control study done from, uh, from uh, uh, people evaluated in the context of an outbreak in, of Legionnaires' disease in Holland, in which there were hundreds of cases, and the investigators were able to identify people that attended the flower show where this outbreak occurred because of a decorative fountain that was contaminated, and also uh, people that had the disease. So we had exposed controls that didn't get in the disease and exposed people that did get the disease, and it's pr proven a useful uh, uh, population set for this kind of study. Using that same population, uh, Tom identified a hypofunctional, or a couple of hypofunctional polymorphisms in TOL4 that were associated with uh, resistance to this infection for reasons that are not entirely clear. Now, some years ago, we set up uh, experimental aerosol exposure systems so that we could develop rodent models of uh, infection to, to, to evaluate uh, innate and adaptive immune responses. We started off with a, uh, uh, a, a system that was hand-built by Tom Martin, my research mentor, uh, and adapted this to uh, use with uh, initially rats and then uh, mice and became known as our Bellevue Ratford Hotel. And then we subsequently moved on to a more sophisticated uh, computer-driven system that we continue to use now. And we've used these uh, models to, to, to study a variety of uh, uh, innate immune response pathways uh, and, and their role in infectious disease, uh, particularly this infection. And we found that the lung clearance of Elnomophila requires interferon gamma and uh, TNF, but not type 1 interferons. And so these panels all show uh, uh, the lung burden of bacteria, colony-forming units per lung on a log scale uh, over time. The wild-type uh, mice readily clear this infection. Mice are very resistant, uh, but interferon gamma knockouts are completely unable to clear this and will eventually succumb. Uh, similarly, mice lacking the TNF receptors have a markedly delayed clearance, but uh, mice that uh, uh, lack the type 1 interferon receptors uh, are uh, unimpaired. Similarly, uh, we have found that clearance of Legionella requires MITE88, the adapter molecule that's common to most toll-like receptors. Uh, uh, mice that, uh, and uh, NTOL2, but not TOL4, 5, or 9. So again, these are just uh, uh, similar to the last slide, uh, showing lung burden of bacteria over time. Mice that uh, lack the MITE88 adapter molecule are completely unable to clear this. In fact, they will die relatively um, within a week or so. But, uh, uh, and similarly, we see a significant defect in clearance in mice lacking TOL2, uh, but no impairment in TOL5 knockouts, TOL9 knockouts, or uh, ultimately TOL4 knockouts. Now, more recently, we've been interested in the role of the inflammasome in resistance to this organism. And uh, uh, this, this uh, cartoon shows... Uh, uh, the concept of inflammatome-mediated resistance to Legionella in mouse macrophages. This system was mostly derived, in fact, entirely derived from studies with uh, mouse uh, bone marrow-derived macrophages. And basically what we see here is that uh, the organism settles into its vacuole. Um, there's some stimulation of uh, toll-like receptors on the way in that produce the uh, uh, proforms of IL-1-beta and IL-18. 
And then the type 4 secretion system either secretes or leaks components of the flagellin molecule into the cytoplasm, which are recognized by NAPE, the neuronal apoptosis inhibitory protein. And that uh, recognition results in assembly of the NLRC4 inflammasome. And the purpose of the inflammasome is to activate caspase 1. When caspase 1 is activated, the proforms of IL-1 beta and IL-18 are converted to their active forms, where they can be secreted to the cell and act on their receptors both in an autocrine and paracrine fashion to stimulate multiple components of the innate and adaptive immune response. Caspase 1 activation also can promote phagolysosomal fusion by mechanisms that are not entirely clear. And perhaps most importantly, it stimulates a specific cell death pathway called pyroptosis that was originally described by Brad Cookson here at the UW, working with different models of intracellular infection. And this is thought to be a mechanism by which a hopelessly infected cell gives up the ghost and um, uh, uh, essentially kills itself in order to deprive the organism of a replicative niche. Uh, and in contrast to apoptosis, this is a disruptive uh, cell death mechanism that releases inflammatory uh, uh, mediators into the surrounding media that also then serve as a danger sign. So we were interested in how this system might apply to mouse alveolar macrophages and human alveolar macrophages, which are quite different cells. So we found that the, uh, the uh, inflammasome activation in a mouse alveolar macrophages does indeed uh, require flagellin and NLRC4. Uh, this shows IL-1 beta secretion, uh, where if we stimulate macrophages with, with the wild type strain of Legionella, we get IL-1 beta, a marker of inflammasome activation. If we use an aflagellar mutant, it doesn't occur. Uh, this also, this reaction doesn't occur in mice lacking the NLRC4 inflammasome. Similarly, uh, cytotoxicity, a measure of pyroptosis, uh, uh, is stimulated by wild-type bacteria, but not by the aflagellar mutant. And again, this requires uh, NLRC4. Um, now, surprisingly, uh, flagellin and NLRC4 mediate resistance of mice to Legionella. And that's evident both in the interaction of alveolar macrophages in vitro and in clearance of the infection in vivo. In the left panel here, we're seeing replication of the organism uh, using strains of, of Legionella that uh, uh, express the Lux gene so that replication can be measured by light emission from the cell. And so luminescence on a log scale is shown here over time, and we see that the aflagellar mutant replicates readily uh, in the cell, but the wild-type strain does not, nor does the strain that lacks the uh, type 4 secretion system. So uh, if there's flagellin present, the uh, uh, pyroptosis is activated and the bacteria can't replicate. Uh, in, in knockout uh, macrophages that lack NLRC4, both the wild type and the aflagellar mutant replicate. And then in uh, mouse challenge studies, uh, mice that lack this inflammasome have a significantly delayed clearance. But as we know, mice are not humans, as we're <laughs> frequently reminded. Uh, so there's value to looking at human cells. And we've found that, uh, or others have found, uh, that human nape differs from murine napes. Uh, this is the key receptor that activates this inflammasome, whereas mice express multiple nape proteins. Uh, nape 1 senses the needle proteins of type 3 secretion systems. Nape 2 senses membrane spanning rods. Nape 5 and 6 recognize flagellin. Humans express only one nape protein, which recognizes the needle protein of type 3 secretion systems, but only the full length isoform senses flagellin and not very sensitively. Um, and there may be cell-specific isoform expression. We, in fact, found that Legionella does not induce flagellin-dependent inflammasome activation in human alveolar macrophages. So, uh, again, looking at IL-1 secretion as a marker of inflammasome activation, um, there's really almost no IL-1 induction by either wild-type or aflagellar mutant uh, uh, Legionella. We can induce uh, uh, IL-1 secretion by stimulating with a needle protein, transfecting the cells with a needle protein, but not with purified flagellin. So the human alveolar macrophages don't recognize flagellin and don't stimulate uh, IL-1 release or inflammasome activation in response to Legionella. Similarly, very little cytotoxicity occurs, and it's not significantly different between the two strains of bacteria that we tested. Finally, flagellin expression does not influence replication of Legionella in human alveolar macrophages. Uh, this is, again, a, a luminescence assay in a log scale, and both the wild type and the uh, aflagellar mutant bacteria replicate equally well 
in contrast to the uh, mouse macrophages. So in human cells, there is no NLRC4 inflammasome mediated resistance to Legionella. Uh, the, uh, the, the, if flagellin is uh, leaked or exported into the cytoplasm, it is not recognized by NAEP. There is no caspase one activation. Uh, there is no inhib inhibition, or there's no uh, promotion of phagolysosomal fusion. Uh, there's no uh, uh, pyroptosis and very little secretion of IL-1 and IL-18. And this probably explains the difference between mice and humans in terms of their susceptibility to this disease. Back to humans. Legionnaire's disease is on the rise. Um, most cases are sporadic. Um, uh, it accounts for somewhere between 1 and 10 percent cases of community-acquired pneumonia with regional differences, but a higher proportion of severely ill cases that come to the ICU. Outbreaks get most of the attention uh, associated with hotels, resorts, cruise ships, hospitals, and skilled nursing facilities. Summer fall uh, is most common, warm water again, aerosolizing warm water, um, but it can occur year-round. And notably, the incidence is rising. Between 2000 and 2015, uh, these are CDC data, there's been a more than fourfold increase in the reported cases of, um, uh, of Legionella. 6,000 cases were reported in 2015 to the CDC. It is a reportable disease. And that's thought to represent less than 10% of the total number of cases because the disease is underdiagnosed and underreported. For example, at Harborview, we rarely diagnose cases of Legionnaire's disease. Um, I can remember a handful over the case, course of the last 10 years. And yet, when Dave Park and Dick Root and others did a random uh, perspective study of uh, cases of community-acquired pneumonia admitted through the emergency room in the 1990s, 523 cases, Legionella infection was found in 7%. Now, it was the second most common pathogen identified. So we're, we're, we're treating these patients without recognizing the diagnosis. In Washington State, there's a similar trend. 253 cases from 2005 to 2013. Uh, ranging from 14 to 42 cases per year. 40% of these cases are immunocompromised, and the incidence tripled between 2005 and 2013. Most of these cases were diagnosed by the urine antigen test, which accounts for the prominence of Legionella pneumophila. The blue is Legionella pneumophila, and the other uh, colors here are other species that are identified. Others that have been isolated in the state include McDadii, Dumafii, Long Beachi, Bosmanii, Filii, and Massachernii. But uh, given that most of these cases are diagnosed by uh, urinary antigen testing, it's only going to be El Nemophila that's, um, uh, that's confirmed. What about at the UW Medical Center? Well, this nice study by, uh, that was uh, by Sigmund Mammon that was published in the Transplant Infectious Diseases uh, last year uh, showed 32, reported 32 cases between 1999 and 2013. This would not include the five cases in 2016 or the two cases uh, last summer. Um, of these 32 cases, 31 were immunocompromised, um, mostly transplant recipients, evenly divided between um, stem cells and uh, solid organs. Uh, others had uh, hematologic malignancies, were receiving anti-TNF therapy for rheumatoid arthritis, or steroids for sarcoidosis. El pneumophila and McDadii were most common. Other species are, isolated, are shown here. Pneumophila is in blue, McDadii is in this uh, bronze color. Uh, but again, Tucsonensis, Wadsworthii, Dumafii, Long Beachy um, were also seen. Wadsworthii, named after the Wadsworth VA, which is now called the West Haven or the West LA VA, had more than 200 cases of Legionnaires' disease over the course of five years. Long Beachy, named after the Long Beach VA. Um, the uh, mortality was 32 percent in transplant patients, despite antibiotic treatment. And what this shows is that in a place like the UW, where we have a lot of immunocompromised patients, these are going to be the ones that are going to tell us when there's trouble in the air. So, summarize again, things to know about legionellosis, it's caused by aquatic bacteria of the genus Legionella, more than 60 species, uh, widely distributed in fresh water, intracellular pathogens whose natural hosts are amoebae, acquired by inhalation from aerosol disseminators, there are two clinical syndromes, Legionnaire's disease pneumonia, Pontiac fever, non-pneumonia, uh, sporadic or epidemic, uh, often opportunistic, diagnosis by culture, antigen detection, or PCR, treatment with a fluoroquinolone or azithromycin. So I'll leave you uh, with this uh, 
song written by uh, uh, Bob Dylan, uh, his take, the song called Legionnaire's Disease, um, his take on the epidemic. He had some unusual ideas about the pathogenesis of this. Um, but, uh, uh, and I'm not sure, I don't believe he actually ever recorded this, but others did. Uh, but, oh, that Legionnaire's disease. So that's it. Thank you for your attention, and uh, I think we have time for a little bit of questions. Thank you, Dr. Scared. If anybody has questions, please raise your hand. I will get to them. That was a great talk, Sean. Thank you. Um, can you talk about why guinea pigs are so exquisitely sensitive if mice are very resistant? Why guinea pigs are? You know, it, that's really not known. I mean, they were used as a model system early on, um, and um, and until not that long ago, I used them mostly to passage the organism uh, because they grow so luxuriantly. I suspect they, that the, 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 the difference is probably related to inflammasome uh, activation, but it has, to my knowledge, that has not been tested. Sean, yeah. um, I'd be interested in knowing whether we are aware of the incubation period for Pontiac fever. Um, the incubation, it's interesting, the incubation period for Pontiac fever is very short. Um, and whereas with Legionnaire's disease, it's between two and 10 days. Uh, some days, some uh, cases may be as long as 14. In the outbreaks of Pontiac fever, it was uh, 48 hours or less uh, in most cases. So uh, that's a very different syndrome. And, and uh, you know, the Pontiac outbreak where, where essentially everybody in the building got sick and got sick very quickly all at the same time. Uh, suggests a different um, pathogenesis, but and whether that's related to inoculum, it's not clear. There, there was a case, uh, two cases reported in Science actually by David Fraser, the uh, uh, the person in charge of the original outbreak who went on to become president of Swarthmore College. Um, he uh, reported two cases of uh, people that were uh, trying to that went to clean out a water tower. The first person uh, went in the water tower while the fan was still on, and he got Legionnaire's disease. Uh, the second person went in after the, water, the, the fan was turned off, and he got Pontiac fever. And so they were speculating that it was a dose phenomenon, but the fact is it's not really clear, nor is it understood why the incubation period is so short. Yeah. Hi, thanks for a great talk. Um, there was a story on NPR the other day about a Legionnaire's outbreak in Flint, Michigan yeah. that coincided with the uh, lead crisis. Yeah. Um, the thought being that the lead was binding the chlorine in the water and then allowing for more Legionella to yeah. grow. I'm wondering if, um, and then when you mentioned the Spirit Lake issue with high iron levels in the water, I'm mm -hmm. wondering if um, heavy metals in the water have been sort of considered as an additional factor in some of these. Yeah, that, that's a good good thought. And that, yeah, that, I heard the same story, actually. Uh, and they interviewed Michelle Swanson, who I know who's been studying this disease for years. Right, Flint basically traded, they switched water supplies, they traded lead toxicity for Legionnaire's disease. So, you know, uh, they, uh, but it was interesting because it did seem to be related. There was an interaction between the lead and the chlorine that, inter that, that affected the, the infectivity. And I think those are factors that we really have very little understanding of, but I suspect there's much more of that that is, as, despite the fact that there's a great deal of attention paid to the water biology of this organism, I mean, including here locally, this is a big problem. It's virtually impossible to get rid of. Um, and most hospitals have given up monitoring just because it's hopeless. The bug, bug is there. Um, the question is, how do you keep it under control? And, but this kind of understanding can be helpful in, in, diagnose, in, in, in designing uh, domestic systems and, and perhaps in monitoring and treating uh, institutional systems. Yeah. So continuing sort of down that pathway, first of all, thank you for that excellent presentation. Um, sorry, uh, continuing down that pathway, though, has anyone looked into the um, effect of aerosol particulate size on the infectivity of Legionella? Yes, uh, there's been a lot of work done on that. And uh, uh, basically, uh, this is an alveolar pathogen. And it, uh, there really is no airway involvement with this infection. So the particles have to be between two and five microns in size to reach the alveoli. Um, smaller particles will just go in and out and also probably wouldn't support the bacteria. Um, there are different strains of Legionella that probably have differing um, uh, stabilities in aerosols in terms of their uh, resistance to desiccation as the aerosol droplets are, are cooled, they become smaller. 
um, and that probably impacts on the infectivity. So there's been a lot of work done on that. Also, um, the presence of amoebae uh, that in the aerosol can also impact on infectivity. Legionella becomes more virulent if immediately after it's infected an amoeba as it's searching for a new host, uh, and that also in, impacts on aerosol infectivity. So there's been a lot of research about that. Yes? Again, thank you for a beautiful talk. Uh, you mentioned that it's really difficult to eliminate uh, the bacteria. What should be done in institutions to either prevent or, or sequester or, or essentially control yeah. uh, prevention of disease or, or prevent disease? Well, I mean, there's a lot of controversy about that. Uh, and there, I mean, the usual things that are done, I mean, uh, hyperchlorination uh, works, it, but it's damaging to, uh, uh, to pipes. It can uh, disrupt biofilms and create other problems. Um, uh, UV light has been used. I think the, 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 probably the most important thing is just um, maintenance and, and making sure that you get rid of old stuff that you don't need anymore. Um, what was done here is, uh, is, is really um, an intensive uh, effort at diagnosis to identify cases and make sure that they, uh, uh, and also to identify where the organism was. Uh, uh, Legionella um, uh, uh, is in the, it's in one of the towers, Pacific or Cascade, I forget which one, uh, Legionella pneumophila but it's not in the other towers. There are other species that are in the other towers. So, I mean, that kind of monitoring may be helpful. There's much controversy about whether monitoring is useful just because it's so likely to be positive. There, there, and the CDC has been uh, really a, a little bit unclear about this. So I think the important thing is being able to recognize uh, when you've got a problem. I mean, in a place like this, we have our, our, our sentinel canaries, um, the, all this population of uh, immunocompromised patients that are gonna tell us when there's a problem, um, and uh, being aware and attentive to that. And then uh, what's, what the other thing that was done here locally is filters. Um, they After the 2016 epidemic, they hyperchlorinated uh, the, the water supply, and then they added uh, endpoint filters to faucets and showers, 0.2 micron filters that are standard bacterial filters. The trouble with those is they can get, uh, they, they, uh, they need to re be replaced very frequently, often within days. It's very expensive. Um, uh, strategies, another strategy that um, I was talking to Andrew Bryan about recently uh, is that uh, I haven't seen much about is, is trying to target the protozoa and using a larger filter in a, more proximal in the system to try to prevent uh, access of protozoa. Those filters would be easier to maintain because uh, the protozoa are so much larger, um, but I'm not aware of evidence that that's been used um, effectively. But this is a big, a big issue in industrial hygiene. Okay, well thank you so much.